So, let us look at how we will handle this value function approximation, right. So, remember what we are interested in, let us say in most of these control cases, right, we will stick with the q function for the time being. In most of the control cases, you are interested in learning the q function, right, you want to learn q of s t a t. So, what we are going to assume now is that q of s t a t is given by some function f, right, that takes as input s t and a t and has a set of parameters w t, right. So, these parameters w t will let you, you know, define what the function is, right. So, like I said, you have to choose some functional form that is given by f. So, f could be like I said earlier, right, some uh, a times or, or, or uh, since we are using w, so it will be w 1 times s t plus w 2 times a t right? and that could be very well the, uh, uh, the function f and I have to learn what is w 1 and what is w 2. This is assuming that s and a are numbers, right, that I can directly plug into this kind of a multiplication, right. So, we will come to that in, in a bit, right. So, in the next uh, uh, couple of slides, we will think about that, right. So, this could be one way of just defining what my uh, f is, right. So, this is kind of a, like a linear way of defining what f is going to be, right. So, now once I have a function like this, right, and so it is, so my f is supposed to approximate q, right. So, if, uh, uh, q star, right, that is what I am trying to do in q learning or in SARS or whatever, eventually I am trying to learn what is q star, right. My f is, f, f is supposed to approximate q star and uh, so what will I do? So, ideally if it is a normal, uh, you know, least squares regression problem, so I will have pairs like this, right, I will have s t a t and then my target will be q star s t a t. Right. So, I will have uh, t equal 1 to n, I will have n such samples, right. So, I will have STAT q star STAT as my uh, training data, right. So, that is how my regression will work, right. I will have a, uh, for every possible values that the input can take, I will have some uh, uh, regression target. I will use this and do a least squares fit, right, minimize the least squared uh, error or residual error of the prediction and use that to learn my weights, right. So, I, I, I could set it up with a gradient update like this, right. So, this is my target q star, right, this is my current output q s t a t, right. I will take the gradient of that with respect to the parameters w t and then I will use that uh, to make a change to w t and that will give me my new w t plus 1. So, all of you are familiar with this, right. So, this whole uh, kind of a, 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 a minimum least squares uh, estimate for uh, the parameter. So, so f q here is basically f of s t comma a t right. So, that is where the, the gradient if you are wondering where w t comes in this is where the w t is going to come in right. So, so what is the problem in, in learning doing least squares fit for the regression. So, all of you know how to do this right. So, you have learnt regression in, in, uh, in multiple uh, courses now. And if I give you data of this form, right, S T A T and Q star S T A T, I can just solve this regression problem, right. And here I've just written it out as uh, solving it using gradient descent, uh, but you can solve it, right, in other methods also, and you are happy, right. The biggest challenge here, though, is that we don't know the target Q star A star. If I know the target Q star A star, what am I computing? If I know how to compute Q star A star, a uh, Q star, sorry, Q star of S T comma A T. If I know how to compute q star of st comma a t, then there is no learning problem that I have to solve, right. So, given some st a t, if I can get you what q star is. The biggest challenge in RL is unless I compute the whole problem, I do not know what q star st a t is. Unlike other uh, regression problems where I can just measure the output, right, I can measure the value of the function f for a given s and a and then I can give that as a target to you, right. Here, we do not have a easy way of measuring what q star is, right. You really have to compute what q star is, right. So, since we do not know the target, right, so we have to figure out another way of doing it. So, the biggest challenge is that we do not know the target, right. If we know the target, we have already you know computed q star, right. So, what do we do now that we do not know the target? So, one way of getting around the fact that we do not know the target is to use the TD target. Right, the temporal difference target. Remember, when you are doing Q learning and SARS or anything like that, we do this one step, uh, uh, you know, look ahead and then use the uh, 
the one step return right one step truncated cor corrected return as our target right so the same thing that we can do here right so i don't know q star is tat right i replace that with this one step in this particular case i'm using the q learning return right so i'm replacing it with the one step q learning return and that gives me an estimate of what q star stat is remember the td part so for finding out the better estimate for uh, uh, q q of stat i use the current reward plus q of st plus 1 right so that's basically what we do here right so this is the td part right and so so this whole thing is called the td error as you will remember right sometimes we will denote this by delta right so this will be delta t right um, and so we will see we will we'll, we'll use this right so basically the idea here now becomes okay so for the weights right so i will update it by taking the gradient of the td error delta t right then td error comes from using rt plus 1 plus gamma max over a q s t plus 1 comma a minus q s t a t right and, and the squared of that so that because i am doing the uh, squared uh, least squared error right so now this gives rise to a challenge so what is the challenge i am using i am learning q right so if you think about it i have kind of hidden it right but this is actually right and this guy is also f right that's the problem right so i'm using w uh, for generating my target as well as my current estimate right both the estimate and the target are generated by w and this can give rise to problems later but for the time being let's just uh, stick with this and see where we can right and so what we have done here is essentially you are using gradient descent this is just to give you a quick just to give you a quick recap of what we uh, what we learnt in uh, neural networks right so gradient descent is a first order uh, uh, algorithm for finding the local minima of a differentiable function so we have already seen that so uh, the idea is that uh, you are going to use the taylor series expansion of the loss function right so you have f of x0 uh, uh, plus h is approximated by f of h, h x naught plus h times f dash of x naught right so where uh, if, if the movement is small enough right so this can be approximated by mu multiplying the uh, derivative of f at x naught times h right so this is the this is the taylor series expansion right and what we really want to do is suppose you take the loss function right so the loss function basically it you are currently at some parameter theta right and you want to make a small step right delta t right so some alpha times delta theta is what 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 is the change that you are making in the uh, 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 in the theta right so that's like this h right so your f is the loss function your x naught is your current setting for theta that's the weights right and alpha times delta theta is the change that you make with respect to the current setting right so that's that's equal to the h so this is approximated by so the loss at uh, loss at theta so l theta plus h which is alpha delta t delta theta sorry uh, h is alpha delta theta times f dash which is the gradient of the loss function with respect to theta right so what you want to do is to make sure when i make this small step the loss goes down as much as possible right when i want to make when i take the small step i want the loss to go down as small as much as possible right so remember this gradient of loss with respect to theta is the direction at which the function climbs the steepest right this is the direction in which the function climbs the steepest at theta right so this is how the this is the interpretation of the gradient and so if my delta theta alpha is a constant it's just a scaling factor right if my delta theta right lies in the direction opposite to the gradient right then i'll get the maximum change right so delta uh, the gradient of uh, l with respect to theta at computer at theta gives me the steepest direction of movement of the loss function at the value of theta 
right so when at, at theta it gives me the steepest direction of movement of the loss function so if my delta theta is in the direction opposite to that then it will cause the biggest change in the loss function so that's basically the approximation that we want to use here right so that's that's the idea logic behind gradient descent as most of you know and of course if you want to do gradient ascent then i move in the direction of the gradient and of course there are problems with gradient descent because it will get you into local optima but for optimizing uh, pro, uh, uh, problems with very 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 large number of parameters uh, so gradient descent seems to have a uh, 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 it seems to have developed good good enough libraries and then we can use all these new developments in gradient descent that you learnt about when you were doing the deep learning course all of that can be used now for learning in the uh, and the reinforcement learning setting as well right so we do a little bit of a trickery when we actually look at how to compute the gradient for the value function update so remember so when i said that we are looking at the value function update right so that the w comes in two places right so what are the two places the w comes in w comes here and the w comes here right w comes both both at the target and at the w comes both at the target and at the uh, uh, current estimate right when i'm taking the gradient right so i'm taking the gradient of uh, uh, this so if you, if you go back and look at what we did so i'm going to take the gradient of this delta right so i have wt appearing here and wt appearing here so what we do in most approaches is that we ignore the gradient with respect to the td target or or rather we ignore the gradient of the td target right so uh, when we compute the gradient we ignore the td target so it is what is called as a semi gradient method right these are called semi gradient method and actually we can in practice they work well right and you can also show that under some conditions semi gradient methods are also guaranteed to converge to some kind of a local optima but it's not a, uh, it's not the true gradient right it's still an approximation of the gradient so let's look at how it uh, plays out in the case of linear functions right so let's see how this plays out with the linear function approximator so what we mean by linear function approximators so i have my q function that is going to be expressed as an inner product of some encoding of the states and actions into into some some vector form right times wt right? so that's basically what the linear function approximator is right so the phi is some representation of the states and actions into a form that is amenable for numerical computation right so if i have a state representation that is described by whether the bump sensor is there and and if there is a colored object on the screen if it's red and blue so these things become really hard for me to you know plug into numerical computations right and uh, so i would like to convert that into some kind of a vector form that's convenient for numerical computation so we'll see how we do that in a little bit right so for the time being just assume that you've given a state action pair i can convert that into some kind of a vector form right and then i take the inner product of that vector into the parameters to give me the q function so this is the the linear form right why is why do we call this a linear form so i don't know anything about the phi right but once i get the phi there are no terms of the form you know phi1 phi2 or anything like that so just a the phi vector and none of the parameters get into a product so when i'm trying to take the derivative of the error function with respect to wt right i'm taking the derivative of the error function with respect to wt all the w's will show up in a linear form there are no square or squares of the w's or the products of the w's or anything and therefore this is a good good enough approximator right so even though depending on how i define phi right uh, i could have a very very complex function of the state itself but of the weights it's a it's a linear function therefore it's we call this as linear function approximators right so once we have computed the q then we compute the td error right so the td error is basically computed by looking at what is the next state that results from performing action at in st right so before i compute the td error what are the things i need i need st i need at then i need rt plus 1 and then need st plus 1 right so all of these four components that i need before i can compute the td error when i'm using the q learning error if i'm using the sarsa error i'll need at plus 1 as well right but now let's assume that i have up till st plus 
and then I can go ahead and do RT plus 1 plus gamma. Now, I will run ST plus 1 and every one every action through my function approximator again, right. So, I will compute Q of ST plus 1 comma A1, then I will compute Q of ST plus 1 comma A2 and so on and so forth. So, for every possible action I can take, I will run it through the function approximator again, right. And then I will find out what is the max action, right, according to the current estimates of the Q function at ST plus 1 and then I will compute the TD error. Now, once I have the TD error, what do I have to do next? I have to find the gradient of the square of the TD error, right. That is basically what my least squares formulation is, right. I find the gradient with respect to Wt of the TD error, right, square of the TD error. Now, is where I use the semi gradient idea. So, if I had been finding the true gradient, right, then I will have to take the gradient of the W that appears in the target also, but it is a bit of a challenge, right. And now it there is a max out there, and we really have to figure out how this max has to be handled, right. Or even if I am using a SARSA thing, right, I still have to take the gradient but with respect to W at two different places, right. So, what people have shown is that hey, I can for the time being assume that this is just the target, right. This is just the target, and the target is not changing with respect to my parameters. Just assume that the target is not changing with respect to my parameters. And then I take the gradient of this error, right? I take only the w's that appear in the prediction term, not in the target term, right? So, that is what the semi gradient methods do, right? So, I will take the gradient with respect to uh, uh, the only the prediction term, right? Take the gradient with respect to only the prediction term. So, since I am assuming this is a fixed target, so when I take the gradient, what happens to the target? The target goes away. Right? Of course, I, I still have this two thing, right? So, so I need to put a two somewhere. Yeah, I forgot the two, right? So that two will come down, and this the term in the brackets is just the delta t. So the delta t will come as it is. Now I have to take the derivative of the uh, delta with respect to the uh, the t d error with respect to w t. Since I am assuming this is a constant term, right, this and this will vanish, and I only have to take the gradient of QSTAT with respect to WT. And if I look at the gradient of STAT with respect to WT, it is what? It is just P, right, because that is that is basically what I have, uh, how, how I have defined my Q, right. So, if we take the gradient of Q with respect to WT, it is just phi again, right, because it is a linear uh, function. So, so my overall gradient now becomes delta T phi of s t comma a t. So, basically the input times delta t. So, and of course, the minus would come because of this minus and the 2 comes from the square, right. And of course, if you remember our update had a half there. So, the half and the 2 will go away, right. And uh, so, you basically have uh, instead of uh, uh, minus, now the minus and minus becomes plus. So, w t plus 1 equal to w t plus alpha delta t phi of s t a t. So, this is the final gradient update rule for my Wt assuming that I am using a linear function approximator for the Q function, right. So, this is basically the final update rule that I have. Whether I am using SARSA, whether I am using TD learning, this will be the final update rule if I am using semi gradient updates, okay.